Newfound Gold has discovered 93 grams per ton of gold over 19 meters starting at only 96 meters downhole. Some of the biggest names in the mining world have shown their approval of what Newfound Gold has discovered. They now own over 35% of our shares. With over 70 million in working capital, Newfound Gold is well positioned for what the future brings. To learn more, find us online at newfoundgold.ca. Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix, and joining me today on the program is Mark O'Byrne, Research Director at Goldcore. How are you today, Mark? Very good, Tom. How are you? Excellent. Great to have you back. Uh, I thought we could start by talking a little bit about what a currency reset could look like and what some of the parameters would be to consider when we're thinking about something like that. Um, well, it, it won't be pretty, let's put it that way. <laughs> it will be very messy, but there's, I mean, there's so many variables that it's very hard to be definitive about it. The bottom line is that we were some of the first analysts to talk about this back in the mid 2000s, shall we say, you know, in the 2007, 8, 9 period we started talking about because we thought it was quite likely then, given the scale of debt in the world. And, and now, yeah, it, it's, it's even more likely today, obviously, because the debt is even bigger today than it was then. And the scale of the coming uh, financial and uh, economic depression is going to be so huge that, uh, yeah, a reset is, is very, very likely. So, and in effect, what, what they're doing is it's a little bit like the historical precedent is what President Roosevelt did in 1933. So he basically devalued the dollar and revalued gold. He devalued the dollar because there was massive deflationary pressures, because businesses were failing, massive unemployment, there was a lack of demand. Businesses and banks, indeed, were vulnerable uh, to, to collapsing. So in order to engender inflation, they devalued the dollar. And basically, they, some people say they confiscated gold. They didn't really confiscate gold. They confiscated the currency at the time, which was the dollar, which was backed by gold. So they confiscated the currency at the time in 1933 at $20 per ounce. And then a few months later, they quickly revalued. Uh, they had the gold from the people. The people didn't get the benefit of this revaluation, as is frequently the case. The governments did and the central banks did. So then they revalued the gold from $20 to $35 per ounce, a 70% increase overnight by government fiat, a government diktat. And they fixed the price down to $35 per ounce. And that basically meant that the dollar was devalued vis-a-vis currencies around the world and yet gave the US uh, economic advantage. It was a form of a competitive currency devaluation. So the same thing is going to be seen again. Sorry, not the same thing, a similar thing. That's why people look at that precedent. And it doesn't mean we're going to have a confiscation of gold because so few people in the Western world actually own gold. So they're not going to confiscate gold at an individual level. But what they will confiscate gold is most probably at the exchange level. And gold may be confiscated from the large gold exchanges and the exchange trade of funds as well. But the bottom line is, yes, so currency reset means you're devaluing your currency versus gold, particularly the dollar, because the dollar remains the reserve currency of the world. And the speculation is that the monetary authorities, uh, whether it be the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, uh, International Monetary Funds, uh, they come together and they plan the devaluation of the dollar, but most probably in conjunction, you couldn't do it solely with the dollar, so most probably in conjunction with other fiat currencies, whether it be the euro, the pound uh, and other fiat currencies, and they may then peg gold at a certain price. And a lot of people focus on the big round number of $10,000 per ounce, as an example, but you could have gold at 10,000 euros per ounce, 10,000 pounds. They could peg it at, with a, a lot of different currencies around the world. And then they do a quasi backing of those currencies with gold because putatively the US has 8,100 metric tons of gold in uh, not in Fort Knox, actually, in the New York Federal Reserve is where it's meant to be, but obviously it hasn't been audited since the 1950s, so there are question marks about that. But the accepted worldview uh, and, and what's said by the authorities is they do have 8,100 metric tons, and therefore they would partially back or fully back this new currency that's set, reset at, say, as an example, $10,000 per ounce. And then the Eurozone central banks, the Bundesbank, the Italian central bank, the, the French central bank, they all have quite large gold reserves as well. But similarly, they haven't been audited a long period of time. And potentially a lot of these 
gold reserves have actually been lent into the marketplace. So there might not be outrightly uh, ownership of these gold bars in the central bank gold reserves. But anyway, so that's roughly how it would look. Um, and uh, But there are just, as I said, so many variables, it's hard to, to map it out. Uh, but the bottom line is that it would happen probably quite quickly over a bank holiday weekend. And frequently people say it could happen in August because that's when there's, as there's less economic activity. It might be less disruptive to economies. So you might announce a, a bank holiday so, uh, on Friday evening, Saturday morning, and the banks and the markets might remain closed on a Monday, Tuesday, uh, and then you basically re- reset the currencies. So I think it's closer now than people think. I don't think it's we're in August now. It doesn't look like it's going to happen this month. But sorry, the other time frame it could happen is Christmas time as well. There's another time that potentially you might see a, a form of currency reset. But it depends. It, it, the bank, the the central banks in the Western central banks and the institutions of the West may be forced to do a currency reset potentially if the Chinese were to go and back their currency with gold. And there's a lot of talk about that as well. And a, a new digital renminbi or digital Chinese yuan with some form of gold backing and therefore if the dollar starts coming under pressure and there's a lot of chatter and and much more than chatter a lot of op-eds from some quite prominent people and Goldman Sachs themselves Morgan Stanley, very senior people writing pieces in Bloomberg and Financial Times and the foreign policy talking about the end of the dollars and reserve currency. And they're not talking about in the medium long term, they're talking about in the short term, potentially quite sharp devaluations of the dollar, you know. So I think it's looking likely at some stage of next year that, that it happens. And that's roughly how it will happen, you know. So as we're speaking about the revaluation of the currency, let's kind of transition to something that seems a little bit more tangible at this time, and that's the risk of a tax in the futures markets. How do these work and why do they try and drive down the price like this? Well, yeah, we're not actually talking about revaluation of the currencies. We're talking about devaluation of the currencies. But in that context, gold then becomes revalued and gold becomes the uh, the currency of last resort and indeed the money of last resort. Yeah, regard to attacks on the futures markets, I, I mean, I wouldn't claim to be the expert on that, although I have written about it and considered it for many, many years in our in our daily market updates on goldcore.com. And the people who put me onto it were GATT at the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, and they have amassed a huge amount of evidence, including official documents over the years. And indeed, the banks have been fined and prosecuted, and they've been found guilty of manipulation, you know. And basically how they do it is, as you alluded to there, it's in the, the futures marketplace. They can go in, and if they want to push the gold price down, significantly or indeed the silver price down significantly they can use the futures price to go in and aggressively sell thousands and thousands of futures contracts of gold in a concerted manner in a short period of time and that can push the gold price down very very quickly indeed and if the the nearest contract futures price which is the price that would tend to be manipulated is pushed down you know it's a hundred dollars or fifty dollars as has been seen very frequently including in recent months at very counterintuitive times when there's been no data points, there's been no economic statistics released, no jobs figures, no GDP figures, no gold data to know for no reason whatsoever. In the middle of nights, frequently in illiquid Asian trading, suddenly there's a massive selling of futures. And all it takes is a trader on the desk of a large Wall Street bank to press the sell button on a lot of futures contracts to push the futures price down quite sharply. And then that ultimately feeds through into the spot market and ultimately it leads to a fall in the actual spot price of gold. And the spot price of gold is obviously which in, dictates the price of physical gold and physical silver. So it actually can lead to the uh, a decline in demand for physical silver because people can get nervous when they see this. They might be about to buy physical silver and gold in volume and suddenly they see the price fall very sharply overnight for no reason whatsoever. And that does make people nervous. And it particularly makes new investors nervous because they say, oh, well, it's very volatile or I don't understand this. Why did this fall very sharply? And it can make them nervous and it can put off your novice investor from coming into the marketplace, you know. Or indeed, it can lead them to suspect that there may be, may be manipulation and it can, that can make them nervous as well because they then think, oh, well, if Wall Street banks can manipulate the price lower, why would I invest in this, you know? So it's important people realize that, yes, it has gone on. Uh, there's a huge amount of evidence there. GATA have done the work in this regard. And, and, and other people, many, many people, including universities, have, have crunched the numbers and they've come to the conclusion that there is manipulation. But the bottom line is, as we see with gold prices at all-time record highs, and we're touching $2,000 in the spot market now, 
Uh, and that's because the, ultimately the forces of supply and demand and the over 7 billion people on this planet will ultimately dictate the price of gold, not the, you know, playing around on computers and electronically selling futures contracts. And that's why gold prices have gone to $2,000 rounds because global demand is internationally is, is very, very strong indeed. And meanwhile, the supply is quite anemic at best, you know. So people need to remember that. Don't worry about short-term manipulations. They have been quite successful in the short term, but in the medium and long term, you know, gold prices will go higher but given the scale of global demand. And that was seen obviously between 2000 and 2011 when gold prices went from $250 in the year 2000 to nearly $2,000 in 2011. So They're powerful in terms of manipulation. They can be powerful in the short term, but in the long term, the laws of economics and universal laws will dictate the price of gold and silver. Mark, as we speak about that, it reminds me of another one of your guys' articles that you have posted on the site entitled Short-Term Weakness Likely Prior to Massive Short Squeeze Propelling Gold and Silver to Much Higher Levels. Are we seeing some of the factors of the attacks play into that short-term weakness? Uh, Yeah, because there was some selling there last week. That came out of the blue, I think it was overnight in Asia. You know, when these manipulations happened, you know, even a year ago, two, three, four years ago, basically prices fell by much more and there tends to be follow through selling. And it's very difficult to tell in the short term, you know. But recently when there has been what appears to be manipulation, they, they don't seem to be as successful at getting the price lower and there tends to be people, the prices tend to bounce back quite quickly as well, you know. So there's a lot of people talking about the short squeeze and they've been talking about it for a long time and it hasn't happened. <laughs> but as we know, just because things don't happen for a long time doesn't mean they're not going to happen, you know. It means you're probably a lot closer today when it does happen. And it, what's very interesting as well, it's important that your listeners are aware of this, is this is moving from beyond the fringe, you know, because these people who have talked about manipulation have been dismissed as conspiracy theorists. Even GAFA sometimes have been dismissed as conspiracy theorists, which is outrageous because they've amassed a huge amount of evidence, you know, from, from mainstream sources and from the central banks themselves. But now it's actually going into the mainstream because a, a journalist called John Otters, who was quite a, a respected journalist, a senior guy in the Financial Times for many years, he's now working with Bloomberg. Uh, he's quite a senior, I think he's an editorial writer. Uh, he's definitely an opinion writer for Bloomberg, uh, specifically on markets. And he wrote an article there on July 27th, so only a, a week and a half ago or so. Basically saying, and that this is the title of the article, a mighty short squeeze may be building in gold. And then the subtitle is, an increase in demand for physical deliveries could trigger a parabolic rise and cause problems for banks. So that right there is is what uh, I think is going to happen. And it may not happen in the coming few short days or coming few short weeks, but I believe it will happen. In, in, I think it will happen in the coming weeks, in the coming months, you know. And we're going to have a show me the money moment show me the real money show me the real gold because there's a lot of ponzi gold out there there's a lot of electronic gold but the real gold is in very short demand indeed you know so the notion that gold is overvalued these levels is complete nonsense because we are most probably going to see this massive short squeeze you know interesting as we're speaking in august here there's a typical seasonal sweet spot from july to september could you tell us more about that Yeah, it's it's been seen, if you go back in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, yes, it's it's quite clear in the data. And it's very difficult to know why different people have posited certain theories why that might be the case. But there's no real clear reason for it, to tell you the truth. And, you know, it it might be just a a seasonal factor. And it could be somewhat of a self-fulfilling thing that (laughs) traders look at the historical and the monthly performance and therefore they tend to be more long in these months that, you know, the traders who have a more short-term perspective are aware of these short-term seasonal influences and therefore they can actually, they can become self-fulfilling because they may position themselves in these months for gains, you know, and then conversely, they might lighten up positions in months where, where gold tends not to as well, you know. Uh, August is interesting because it tends to be a period when Wall Street goes on holidays, uh, not just Wall Street, uh, you know, traders in London and in Paris and Zurich and Hong Kong and Singapore, m- many of them, particularly in the Western markets, would take holidays holidays in August and they go to their retirement villas and their boats. So there tends to be less liquidity in stock markets and there can be corrections in stock markets as well. And therefore, that's another reason why potentially traders uh, might park money in gold in that summer period. You know, So August tends to be strong, September tends to be strong, and then October, there tends to be a correction. And that could be because gold can be correlated with stocks in the short term and therefore uh, October 
uh, can be a, a very wicked month indeed for, for stocks, as we know. And, and the track record for stocks in October doesn't tend to be great. So therefore, gold can be correlated with stocks in short term and therefore it can fall. But yeah, so for whatever reason, it tends to be the second half in July. Uh, July sale tends to be quite strong. August very strong. September very strong. And then, uh, yeah, th- there can be a dip then in October. But then it does tend to be strong into year end, November, December and January. And then it tends to be a dip again around the February, March, April, May period, for whatever reason, you know. So I think given the current climate and what's happening in the world with this pandemic and the crazy response in terms of economic and societal lockdowns, I think people should probably not pay too much signal to the seasonal thing unless you're a very short-term trader you know and, and just focus on the the real world fundamentals of the gold and silver markets today and as we're considering the quote-unquote real world fundamentals where could we see gold and silver prices over the next 12 months mark um it's, it's very difficult to say but <laughs> in terms of being prescriptive and i'm very reluctant to get into prescriptive prices but so as when forced to you look at the big round figures I think it's Bank of America. Obviously, Bank of America, City, and Goldman Sachs have all been very bullish, and, and, and they were all calling for 2,000 gold, and we've pretty much reached 2,000 gold, you know. So I think the next big psychological round figure is obviously 3,000 gold, and I think that's quite possible in the next 12 months, you know. And I think we'll end year end probably above 2,000. We, we may get up as high as 2,100, 2,200 into year end, and then get a correction. But I think if you gave it 12 months out to August 2020, one, I think $3,000 for ounces is quite likely, you know, and with silver, who knows, there's much more volatile beast, but we would be much more bullish on silver than we are on gold because the ratio, even after the massive price appreciation, silver the last month, silver was up 35% in one month. I think it's the best month silver's had in 30 years. But even at that, the gold silver ratio is still around 75 to 1. And so silver still looks very at the press fees of e gold, and therefore, and a lot of big money around the whole world are aware of that. And we're seeing that in our flows. We're going to see a lot of demand for thousand and silver bars. And the premiums have gone up, which is interesting. On a wholesale level, the premiums have gone up 50%. So the Swiss refineries we buy from, their premiums have gone up for the large bars. So that's a clear indication. And this has barely been reported. Again, it's a clear indication that of the scale of the demand for, for silver bars. So any silver, who, who knows? But I think $50 per ounce is, is quite likely in the next 12 to 18 months, you know. And when we get there, we'll only be back at the levels we are seeing in 1980, which is pretty incredible, you know. As we're speaking about demand for bullion, obviously you have a unique perspective working with Goldcore. But you and I were discussing before the call about the World Gold Council saying that demand for coins and bars has fallen by 17% for the first half of this year. Is that something that you feel is accurate? No, I don't know. And it's just totally counterintuitive because we know that demand for coins and bars around the world has, has gone through the roof. You know, the, the mints have reported that, the government mints reported it, the refineries have reported it. And indeed, the dealers around the world have confirmed that there's massive demand, unprecedented. And, you know, getting back to the level of demand we saw in two, the last financial crisis in 2008, 9, 10, you know. So we're seeing that with huge demand for both silver and gold coins and bars in the vaults, particularly in Zurich, but also in Singapore and in London and to a lesser extent in Dublin. And that's been seen by, you know, we speak to the dealers in, in the Western world, we speak to the dealers in, in Hong Kong, in Asia, they're all seeing massive demand, you know. So I think the World Gold Council data is not actually capturing the scale of the demand for coins and bars that's out there, because a lot, a lot of it is not declared. I mean, we occasionally report our statistics in terms of demand and assets under management, but we don't automatically report it on a monthly or a quarterly basis, nor do any of our competitors report that into whether it be the LBMA or the World Gold Council. So therefore, the data they have on coin and bar demand is, I don't think it's accurate, you know, um, <laughs> because, you know, we know that the ETF demand is going through the roof. So it sort of stands to reason that coin and bar demand would be going through the roof at the same time, you know, and not, not have fallen very sharply, as was suggested in that report, you know. So I think demand is much stronger. It's also on the comics. I mean, Reuters reported, uh, it was on Reuters India. Um, very bullish gold stories on Reuters tend to be on Reuters India, not on Reuters.com uh, for whatever reason. But 102 tons, so Reuters on Reuters India reported that 102 tons of gold changed hands on comics' biggest ever delivery day. So this is the biggest day of deliveries of physical gold on the comics. 102 tons of gold uh, when these futures contracts expired. We're taking delivery of, you know, so demand is, is huge because of 
people realise the coronavirus is leading to lockdowns and ultimately to a massive depression, you know. So the demand is, is huge globally and, and supply is in the best. The supply, I think they're more accurate on the supply because the, the mines have to report their, their statistics because they're publicly traded. Most of the, the bullion dealers like ourselves are not publicly traded entities. Most of the vault providers are not publicly traded entities. So they don't report their statistics, but the mines, uh, most of them are publicly traded and the mines actually report their their production statistics, you know. So the World Gold Council, based on what's been reported to them, the, the gold mining industry have said that supply in H1 fell 6% year on year. So we have very significant increase in ETF demand, significant increase, sorry, central bank demand remained high. It did fall year and year, but it was still quite high. And I believe that the coin of bar demand was much higher than, than the official statistics show, you know. So you need to take them with a pinch of salt, uh, I would suggest, and realize that demand globally for coins and bars, uh, whether it be in ETF format or in vaults in Zurich and Switzerland and around the world. And there's lots of new vault providers in recent years that set up, you know, and they do not report what they have. There's, there's massive vaults up in the Alps. We know some of these providers, uh, vaults up in the Alps, and the Swiss banks are buying a lot of gold for their high net worth and ultra high network clients in quite a big way <laughs> and it's not being captured in the statistics or indeed in the headlines and that's what's going to contribute ultimately to this massive short squeeze and to much higher prices you know so yeah it's an important consideration that and as you're speaking about the the banks taking delivery for their high net worth clients we're also seeing a surge in platinum bar deliveries which is maybe something that not very many people are thinking about because we normally just think about the two kind of poster children of the precious metals, gold and silver. So can you tell us a little bit more about the surging of the platinum bar deliveries and why that is? Yeah, it's it's, it's like gold. Uh, I think people realize there's a lot of value there and platinum is very, very depressed. If you look at the long-term charts of platinum, it looks along with gold and particularly silver, it does look very depressed. And palladium has had quite a big move up but platinum has yet to, yet to move up and remains below $2,000 per ounce, you know. And platinum was trading, just bring it up here, like as recently as 2008, just before the last financial crisis, platinum was trading over $2,000 per ounce, you know. And today we're below $1,000 per ounce. In 1980, March 1980, silver was nearly touched again. It was up at 960, nearly touched $1,000 per ounce in, in April 1980. So if you just for inflation, that platinum price, that's the nominal price of 1980. If you're just for inflation, the platinum price of 1980 is probably $2,500, $3,000 per ounce. Uh, and today, as I said, it's it's around what the, just it's below $1,000 per ounce. So a lot of big money players, I think both industry players who use platinum, obviously platinum is different than gold and silver. It's used quite significantly in industry, including in the car industry and in catalytic converts and that. It's also used quite a bit in jewelry as well. So I think a lot of people, whether it be industrial players, but I think also investors, see platinum as good value at prices below a thousand and in the same way that they, t they took delivery of, of gold off the comics 102 tons of gold off the comics the, the biggest delivery uh, ever they're taking the platinum off the exchange in a big way as well you know so it bodes very well for the platinum price i think it does remain quite depressed and i think we're going to see it run in the same way that we've seen platinum run and i think two thousand dollars per ounce is yeah very likely in the coming year or two years you know could we see that same kind of surge in palladium or are they correlated in any way? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're all correlated so much. I think platinum would be more correlated with the precious metals of gold and silver than palladium would. But obviously there is a correlation with platinum and palladium as well. Palladium has moved up massively in recent months, you know. So I think platinum is going to follow suit. And when platinum moves, it really, really moves. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the charts, Platinum was, you know, below five hundred dollars per ounce back in two thousand one, and then it went up to, uh, sorry, yeah, it was below five hundred, and it went up four times up to two thousand in two thousand eight. But when it really moved, it was actually just below a thousand uh, as recently as two thousand six, uh, late two thousand six, and then when it moved, uh, within two years, it had doubled to over a thousand. It went over two thousand one hundred dollars, you know. So when Platinum moves, it really, really moves. And I think it's it's lagged palladium and, and the similar fundamentals, similar demand. But uh, I think platinum is, is more of a precious, precious metal. Uh, it, it doesn't have monetary characteristics, obviously, like gold and silver, but it does have 
investors do see it as a hedge, not as much as a hedge or a safe haven asset as gold and silver, but some investors do see it very much as an inflation hedge, and it is very much an inflation hedge as well, and, and it did very well in the 1970s as well as an inflation hedge. So, yeah, it's undervalued. It continues to be undervalued below 1,000. It's absolutely undervalued, you know. Excellent, Mark. Uh, any concluding thoughts as we wrap up? Yeah, just prepare. I, I do think we're going to come through this. I'm an optimist by nature, but we're going to have a massive depression. The notion that we're having an economic recovery right now is just absolute nonsense. We may see a little bounce here, but it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. Where whatever little recovery we're seeing right now is it's not sustainable and it won't continue. So people need to prepare. They need to diversify, own personal metals in the safest way possible. Uh, and if they do that, they'll come through the, the coming economic crisis better than most. Perfect, Mark. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?